Ready? Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome back. We're in uh, part two of Saving the Save. I'm David Johns, Director of Partner Engagement here with Grace School of Theology. And we are excited to be with you. Um, got a couple folks here in the room. Got a, lots of lots of folks online, and this is going to be uh, this is going to be a great evening with Dr. Anderson. And um, we just want to um, thank everybody for being here, and just remind everybody, you know, that um, we've got the training manual in the email, and um, we're. Excited to be with y'all. So, Dr. Anderson, the floor is yours, sir. Yeah. Thank you, David. And welcome to all of you in New Delhi and Canada, London, and at Ships at Sea. We're glad we can get together once again. I do would like to say a prayer as we get started. <clears throat> Father, whenever we come to your word, we recognize it's not just a history book. It's alive, it's powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. And when we back into 300,000 volts of electricity, we won't sit there, we move. So as we uh, engage with your word tonight, we pray that the Holy Spirit could use it as a scalpel if necessary, and encouragement if if we need it, a light to our path. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I suppose one of the favorite Walt Disney movies of all time is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And in that particular story, we get caught up with, uh, you know, the beauty of, of Snow White or the ugliness of the Wicked Witch or the Poison Apple and whatnot. But behind the scenes, uh, somewhat, uh, uh, we also remember the seven dwarfs. Of course, there's Bashful and Dopey and Doc and Grumpy and Happy and Snoopy and Sleepy, all of them kind of nicknamed after uh, personality traits. And we can see some of ourselves in those dwarfs, can't we? But you know, uh, those uh, seven dwarfs uh, never would grow up as far as we know, as far as stature goes. So what is it that causes dwarfism? Well, in the physical world, uh, there seem to be three sources of dwarfism. One's a malfunction in the pituitary gland, and the features are all normal as far as uh, looking, but just small. Another one is cretinism, and that's a malfunction in the thyroid gland. And a third one is called achondroplasia, and that's where the legs are long and the head is big but the trunk and arms are a normal size and science has not figured out how to make those dwarfs grow into normal size now that's the physical world in the spiritual world that's not true we know exactly what causes spiritual dwarfism and we have the cure and it's in our passage that we're going to look at tonight in first peter chapter 2 verses one through three. Now let me orient you to this passage. Uh, we're calling this, uh, we're giving you five snippets out of uh, the book, Saving the Saved, which sounds kind of crazy, Saving the Saved. How do you save people who are already saved? And last week we tried to explain it as once we're born again, we're in the starting blocks of a race. The goal line is expressed in different ways in the New Testament. One way is to become like Jesus. Uh, but another way is to save your time on earth for eternity. And they call that saving your life. And Jesus talked about that when he told Peter that if someone wants to uh, be his disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. For whosoever would save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. What does the profit of man if he gains the whole world and loses his own life? Or what will a man give in exchange for his life? That's our most precious possession. And I think I tempted uh, Byron there with a million dollars and 10 million and 10 billion and the whole world, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't, I couldn't trick him. He knew if I gave him all that and had the power to do it, that he would lose the meaning of his life. 
because he was going to die at the moment that he got that. So Peter never forgot that lesson, and First Peter is about that very subject. We looked at verse 9 last week, and that's in the introduction. Usually in an introduction to any piece of literature, they'll give you some hints as to what they're going to talk about. In fact, they say in communication in, in general, in the introduction, tell them what you're going to tell them. And then in the body of whatever you're communicating, tell them. And then in the conclusion, tell them what you told them. So Peter's doing that right here. He's telling us in his introduction what he's going to tell us. And what he wants to talk about is receiving the end of our faith. Remember that word means goal. The end, telos, means goal of your faith is what? Not to get your soul to heaven. That came from Plato. The end of our faith is to save our life. And we looked at this word for life. We saw that in the best one-volume dictionary on the Greek New Testament, it's just talking about life on earth and its external physical aspects. But God says you can save that. He says you were created for a special reason. There's a purpose for you that's totally unique. See, no one else on earth has your husband or wife. No one else has your children. No one else has your parents, except siblings, of course. No one else has your neighborhood. No one else has your sphere of influence at work. You are put here for a reason. And it's to be a build, but well, there's several reasons. But it's more than just to uh, get a, uh, there used to be an old song about uh, uh, little houses on the hilltop full of ticky-tacky and they all look just the same. You're going through the cycle of life of being born and getting a little education, getting married, getting a house on the hilltop. And, of course, in Midland, there aren't any hilltops. I realize that. But get a house out on the plains with two oil wells on them. And, uh, but they all look just the same. There's more to it. He says, what we want you to do is save your time on earth for eternity. That's what this verse is all about. Now, we go into the bo body of this letter in verse 13. And in verse 13, all the way into chapter 5, where he's going to start his conclusion, he's talking about, how to save our time on earth for eternity. How to redeem the time. And he says there are three basic ways to do that. Through your character, through your conduct, and through your courage. Now this is not an exhaustive list. He probably could have kept on writing, but for all we know, he was running short of uh, vellum or parchment. Uh, just kidding. Uh, God gave us exactly what we, he wanted to give us through First Peter. The first section is on our character, and it says it's personal sanctification. He says here, he called us to be holy. Be holy as I am holy. And the word holy and the word sanctify are the same Greek uh, word, same root. Hagios is the word holy. And he wants us to be holy as he is holy. That's a statement of conduct. And so he says one way we can save our lives for eternity is through the right conduct, through holy conduct, holy living. It's not just running out and winning people to Christ. It's not just uh, working in the nursery at church. All those things are good, and they would count. But it's becoming like Jesus. It's allowing the Holy Spirit to mold us and make us into his life uh, characteristics, his character, his attributes. As a matter of fact, my favorite verse on this, which I'm sure I've quoted before, is 2 Corinthians 3.18. There's sanctification in one verse. We all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. We're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Now, what's the glory of the Lord? What's the glory of anything? What's, when I speak of the glory of Arnold Schwarzenegger, what do you think of or what do you see in your mind? Mr. Universe. Yeah, Mr. Universe. You see him flexing his muscle. Let me give it a demonstration. You see him. Uh, flexing his muscles and his 20-inch biceps and all this. Those are observable character, uh, not character, observable physical characteristics of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that's to the glory of Arnold. But if you speak of the glory of God, what are you talking about? It's an open, public manifestation of what? His character, his attributes. His love, his truth, 
is knowledge, all these things. That's the glory of the Lord. But notice this. In the sanctification process, we are being transformed, are being transformed. Now, that's a passive verb there, which means, says someone is acting upon us to transform us, to change us. If you go over here to the Greek, it's metamorphosis. That's the verb. We know what that is from nature, don't we? Metamorphosis. So we're being changed. How? Into the same image. What? From glory to glory. Now, what does that mean? From glory to glory. Help me out. The glory of the Lord was what? An open public manifestation of his attributes. So if we're being changed into the same image, from what to what? To nature. I hate to think of it. From our glory? I mean, is that what No, no. Same image from glory to glory. If the glory of the Lord is an open public manifestation of his attributes, and we're changing into the same image from glory to glory, what's he doing? Think of a sculptor. What's he doing? For what purpose? The reflection of the glory. Well, in, in this case, in this case, he's trying to make us like Jesus, is he not? So he's making us from one attribute to another attribute of Jesus. From glory to glory. It becomes his glory when we openly display it. When we learn to love as Jesus loved, we are displaying his glory. Does that make sense to you? Well, uh, who's doing this? Here's the beauty of it. Spirit of the Lord, he's the sculptor. This is not a self-help program. This is not a willpower program. This is something where the Holy Spirit is transforming us as we move from character quality to character quality of Jesus. He doesn't do it all at once. It's a process. It takes time. Uh, I actually think it takes about as long to become a mature Christian. Uh, this is just a rough generalization. As it does to become mature physically. Uh, about the same length of time. I haven't met too many mature Christians who have been Christians of three years. But if they've been a Christian 20 years, yeah, a lot of them are fully mature Christians by then. It takes... It takes a while. Michelangelo was publicly sculpting one time. A bunch of young students and other artists had come to watch the master at work. and He just walked around the marble with his hammer and chisel and chip, 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 chip. Kept going around, more and more of the marbles falling down on, around him. And one of the students raised his hand and said, Master, why don't you leave a little more marble on the block? And the master said, as the chips fall, the image emerges. As the chips fall, the image emerges. And many of us come into the Christian life like a hunk of marble. Rough, sharp edges, unformed. And the Holy Spirit just starts walking around. Well, he needs a little more of this. Chip, chip. Uh, needs more of this. Chip, chip. Chip, chip. Year after year after year, he goes around chip, 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 slowly conforming us, as Romans 8 says, to the image of Jesus Christ. All right, that's what the first part of First Peter is about. It is saving the time of your life on earth through your personal sanctification, through your character. And so he's going to talk here about the mandate for holiness in verses 13 through 17. Be holy, for I am holy. Then he goes in to the motive for holiness in 18 through 21. says we weren't purchased. We were redeemed with not with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish. And then he moves into... The means to holiness. The means to holiness is in verses 22 down through chapter 2, verse 3. Let me just read these. This is the means to holiness. Since you have been purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, 
Having been born again. What tense is that? Past, present, or future? Having been born again. So they're already born again, are they not? Okay. That's a done deal. He's moving on from that. That's fini. Fait accompli. Done. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through what? The what? Word of Word God. God. All right. Faith cometh by hearing. You've got to hear it first. That's the incorruptible seed, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. I'll never forget uh, Dwight Edwards telling the story of when we were working together many years ago. And he said, when I heard that God would only take two things off the planet, my life was never the same. One was people, and the other was his word, that both of those will endure forever. So he said, I saw from that if I can invest God's word into God's people, that's the greatest thing I could do with my life. And of course, that's what he does, and he's quite gifted at it. We're going to focus, though, on these three verses in chapter 2, verse 1, 2, and 3. Here we're going to look at the progress, the progressive sanctification that comes through the Word. We want to see barriers to spiritual growth in verse 1. Then we're going to look at food for spiritual growth in verse 2. And finally, the goal of spiritual growth in verse 3. And in the process of doing this, we're going to look at the cure for spiritual dwarfism. You see, we can be like the seven dwarfs. Every Sunday morning, we can get up and say, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to church I go, with well, ha-ha-ha and hee-hee-hee. No, you, you don't like that. <laughs> uh, but uh, and never, never, ever grow. Just go back home and spend the rest of the week doing what I always do, nothing new, nothing different. But again, if you back into 300,000 volts of electricity, you don't sit there, you move. So here's some barriers to spiritual growth. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. All right, first of all, here are some barriers. Too many weeds can keep the seed from growing. They can choke the seed. The soil needs cultivation. The weeds need pulling. Here are some of the weeds that need to be pulled. One is malice. And I hope in your notes you have what that is. Pakia is the word. It's ill will toward a brother or a sister in the church or some other human being. And this is an attitude not becoming the members of God's royal family. You remember years ago the disgust so many people had when... Uh, Prince Charles and his life was revealed and his struggles. And we thought, everyone thought, oh my goodness, not becoming the royal family. Well, we're the royal family. We're a royal priesthood. And he says, malice toward others is not becoming those in a royal family. The word deceit is guile. Remember, Nathaniel was a man in whom there was no Guile. What is that? Ever wonder what that means? Guile? I'm suggesting the word dolos means a devious approach to people which covers a hidden agenda. Devious approach to people that covers a hidden agenda. Hypocrisy. That's pretty much just exactly what the Greek word is. It's transliterated right into English as hypocrisy. Hypocrisis. It's living the lie. Professing one thing, uh, doing another. His life doesn't harmonize with his lips. What we believe and how we behave don't. They're out of sync. We fight with our wife all the way to church, get out and sing some hymns, sleep through a sermon perhaps, and go back in the car and resume our fight. No, no. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Envy. Thanos, an evil eye towards someone who has some position, power, possession you wish you had. 
Envy is the running mate of self-promotion. Evil speaking, lalios, it's putting others down. Lata means down in the Greek language. Laleo means to speak. So it's to speak down to other people, always putting them down. You know the people who are put down more than anyone in the whole world? Any thoughts on that? It's children in the home. In fact, uh, Dr. Dobson, in one of his books, I think Dare to Discipline, says it takes a hundred compliments to offset one deep criticism of a child. Because that criticism cuts so deeply. I remember a uh, man and wife came to my office for some counseling. And I said, well, uh, and she wanted the counseling me now. And I said, well, tell me about your home life growing up. She said, don't go there. I said, well, 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 what do you mean don't go there? i, I got to go know something about your background. We're not going there. Well, we couldn't get anywhere, so <laughs> they just left. Three months later, she was in Rusk. For those of you outside of the state of Texas, that's our state, a sane asylum, you might say, for people with mental illnesses. She was five foot two, about 110, so a pretty small woman. She gained 60 pounds in six months at Rusk, up to 170 pounds. She was part of a small group in our church that had enough money to get her out of Rusk, so they got her out. Uh, it turned out the abuse from her parents as she was growing up was so severe. She had blocked that whole area of her life off wasn't able to forgive them, and consequently, in her own home, hurts were like an anaphylactic shock for her and made her dysfunctional. The good news is that was about 20 years ago. She has been healed. And about five years ago, she got her PhD in counseling to help other people with their struggling. But a lot of hers began with the cut downs or the put downs you'll never amount to anything you know you're, you're you're worthless that came from her parents but of course it doesn't have to be from parents does it uh, any kind of uh cotalalia, speaking evil putting others down vomiting coming out of the mouth of one with the internal stomach problems that we've just talked about so any one of these or any combination of these can be enough to keep us from growing spiritually. Howard Hendricks used to say, it wouldn't be funny if at the judgment seat of Christ, we all showed up in the clothes that represent our progress in the spiritual life. He said, can you imagine the number of babies in the little uh, outfits going goo-goo like this? <laughs> uh, you know, and, and that, that sounds judgmental, but wait a minute, hold on now. If that's judgmental, he's not talking about any particular person. What about this verse? For by this time you ought to be teachers. You have someone to t need someone to teach you again. The ABCs, the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. What's the mark of the baby Christian? Unskilled in the word. Unskilled in the word. We, we lost your screen. You lost my screen? Airplay. 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 Come in to me, airplay. <laughs> Calling airplay. Calling airplay. There it is. All right. Unskilled in the word. You know, what would you say is the key to a victorious Christian life? You know, if I throw that question out to a general audience, I get all kinds of answers. Sometimes they'll say, well, it's praise and worship. You know, if, if, I'm, if you don't have praise and worship, you're just on a head trip. And you'll never go on to maturity. Well, I love good praise and worship, don't you? Others will say, well, no, one person told me it's speaking in tongues. 
He said if he doesn't speak in tongues for 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night, he doesn't have a victorious Christian life. Well, that same young man uh, has been divorced now for quite a while and can't hold a job. And his big downfall was pornography. So apparently the tongue speaking didn't give him victory in his Christian life. Others would say, well, it's, it's having Christian friends. Everyone knows that uh, several logs together burn more brightly than one log all by itself, where the fire could easily get low. But if the scriptures are right, which I tend to think they are, don't you? Then it has to get back somehow to the word of God. We find that all over the place, don't we? Here's uh, an example. Ephesians 4 says, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. As long as we can't rightly divide the truth, we can easily be blown about by every wind of doctrine. How will we have victory in the Christian life? Well, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Well, that's the message of 1 Peter, the first part of the letter, isn't it? We're going to save our lives. We're going to save our time forever through personal sanctification. Here, Jesus is praying for his disciples. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, I've met mature Christians in all sorts of different brands of uh, Christianity, including Roman Catholic, including Charismatic, uh, even Baptist, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> just, just kidding. No, I, I, I've met at least what I think are mature Christians, but they all have one thing in common. They got there through the scriptures. They can handle the word of God. And I'm saying that's uh, what in seminaries they call the sine qua non, which in Latin means that without which you don't have it. And you can be the best worship leader in the world and not be a mature Christian. Uh, you could also be a Bible scholar and not be a mature Christian. So don't, don't mistake what I'm saying, that just by memorizing Bible verses will make you mature. Remember what um, Hebrews said a little while ago. It talked about the word of truth, but it also said people are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. In other words, they don't just have head knowledge. They don't just have biblical knowledge. They have biblical wisdom. And what's the difference? It's not wisdom applying our knowledge to life. Wisdom is applying our knowledge to life. So it's not just knowing what the scripture is saying. It's knowing how to apply that to life situations. And that then uh, brings maturity. So uh, when it comes to Spiritual growth. In verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, Lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. You know, if you saw a, 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 a one year old playing outside uh, on a nice spring day and, and eating dirt, uh, you'd probably tell them to stop eating the dirt. But it wouldn't surprise you, would it? I mean, Kids think dirt, is, that's a toy. You know, we, we play it, we make, build things with it, and we eat it, and all that. And we just smile and say, come on, let's, let's not be eating dirt. But if you saw a 21-year-old boy sitting in the backyard eating dirt, you'd say, excuse me? <laughs> There's something wrong here. And if we've been a Christian 20 years, and we're still eating the dirt of this world, and that's part of our daily diet, we'd have to say, hmm. There's something wrong here. We need to set this aside. We need to move on. We need food. Food for spiritual growth. That's verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Will you notice it doesn't say there are newborn babes? What's it say? As newborn babes. And he said, think back to the little babies. One thing they all have in common is they're suckers, right? They are suckers. 
They suck that milk. I remember my early days of fatherhood. I learned you could fake them out. You know how you fake them out? You all remember something called a That's binky. <laughs> Y'all remember binkies? Do you still use that word? Okay. Now, a binky is even more effective. I found this out, too. If you put a little honey on it, you put a little honey on the binky, then you can uh, pacify that child for a certain amount of time. Sooner or later, they know they don't have the real thing. But uh, they want to stuck. So as uh, newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word. Now this word desire, I want to spend just a moment on that. Here we are. Okay, long for or desire. Do you see these three little words right here? Can you see my cursor? That looks like an E in English, doesn't it? And that looks like the symbol pi. And that looks like an I, doesn't it? Well, it's epi in Greek. It's pretty close to what we see in English. But when you stick those three letters on the front of this, oh, I can't do this one, on this right here, you intensify the meaning of this word. This word means to desire. When you stick epi on it, it's desire on top of desire. In fact, an English word we get with epi is what? Epidermis? What's the epidermis? What's, what's the endodermis? The epidermis is on top. It's the skin on top. So this is desire on top of desire, which means what? An intense desire. So he's saying have an intense desire for the word. Have an intense desire for the word. Yeah, there we go. As a newborn babe, intently desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now, this is kind of interesting here, I think. Have you noticed that some people have this intense desire and some people don't? I've watched that through the word years and I've wondered, well, why do some people just have a yearning hunger for the scriptures and other Christians that we know are Christians? Rarely ever pick the book up. And I don't think I have all the answers on that. It's still somewhat of a puzzle to me. I think part of the answer is different gifts. You know, uh, I have a, a teaching gift, and I think, therefore, God gives me a desire to dig in the scriptures. My wife has the gift of administration. The reason she's not here today is she's out administrating this election. Uh, she's always, wherever we've gone, been administrating things. And, you know, she... She knows the word. She's a, a mature Christian, but she doesn't have the the intense desire uh, that I have. Uh, that doesn't make me better than her. Just different gifts. But it goes beyond that, doesn't it? Because it says none of us can go on to maturity without the word. So somehow we all have to get in the scriptures. So I've thought through the years, is there a way to increase my hunger? Is there a way to develop a hunger for the Bible? And I think there is. And I look back to my college days, and I'd, I'd been a basketball player and always weighed about 185, six foot four. And we'd have three hour practices at, at Rice, and I'd go in after that to the training table. I could hardly eat, I was so tired. And I always lost weight. So now I'm a, a senior, enter my senior year. I asked Betty to marry me. We're going to get married when I graduate nine months away, and I says, you know, I've never weighed over 200. So I need to really impress her with my muscles. So I'm going to gain weight. So uh, I began lifting weights, and I said, well, I've got to exercise more, but I need to eat more. So I went to Baker College for 50 cents in those days. This is 1966. For 50 cents, I got 10 boiled eggs, mixed them up, and drank them. I had a, a handful of bacon and a sweet roll. Then, there, within walking distance, although I had a car by then, was Foots Cafeteria. And for lunch, you could only get one meat and one dessert, but you could get all the vegetables and salads you want. So I had 13 vegetables, five salads, one meat, one dessert. That was lunch. For a dollar and four cents. <laughs> Never forget this, because I did this for nine months. But I went back to the same place for dinner. Five salads, 13 vegetables, one dessert, one meat. In fact, about seven months into this, 
the manager came over to me, and that's when they would check you out with this long white piece of paper with all the things you bought. Uh, he rolled that thing out and said, you see this? We're losing money with you every single day. So we're gonna, even though they, uh, they advertise all you can eat, they said, we're going to ask you to not come back. Well, I, I thought of calling the Houston Chronicle. I thought of calling the, you know, KIKK News. Uh, but uh, uh, Betty was just five miles away, and they had a foot's cafeteria by her house. So that's where I finished up my diet. Now, when you shoot that much acid in your stomach, it really burns. So by midnight, it was burning like crazy. So I had a pound of round steak and a can of Nutriment, and that was my diet. I gained 50 pounds doing that. My weight stayed the same. And on my wedding night, uh, I began to, not in church, but when we got to the motel, began taking my shirt off so I could flex and, you know, press her. And she looked at me and said, would you turn out the lights? <laughs> <laughs> all that effort. Oh, what a man will do to impress a woman. I found with all that weight, though, I couldn't play basketball anymore, and I wanted to do that in the industrial leagues up there. So I promptly lost all the weight. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned something from that. There's a reason for this story. When I hit seminary, I didn't know Genesis from Revolution. <laughs> I mean, I didn't. I, I was a science guy all the way through college. I had learned how to share the four spiritual laws through Camp's Crusade. But I did not know the Bible. And so I'm there to learn it. So, uh, you know, I start taking Greek and start taking Hebrew, have these Bible classes and have these assignments. And to be honest with you, it was, it was pretty, pretty, it was like homework, like schoolwork. And I've never liked school. I just have always loved sports. I always did school because I knew you had to do it to get somewhere. And so that's the way seminary was. All right, well, I'll take this class. All right, I'll take this class. All right, okay. But midway through seminary, a professor spent a summer with me and two friends teaching us how to exegete the scriptures. My friends, that was like going to Foots Cafeteria three times a day. Mm. And it instilled a hunger in me that's never left to this very day. How did it come? It came from eating more, and it came from exercising more, just like the spiritual world. So if you find you don't have a hunger for the scriptures, try eating more and try exercising more. It's interesting that uh, uh, the communists discovered long ago Douglas Hyde's book on dedication and leadership. He was head of the Communist Party in London for 20 years before he became a Christian. He said, as soon as we got a new convert, we would immediately put a bunch of communist tracks in his hand and put him out of the street corner in London to spend a whole day. And invariably, they needed to quit the party right then. But if they came back, they came back with a greater hunger. Why? Because they were bombarded with questions all day long they couldn't answer. And because by openly identifying with communism, it gave them a greater dedication to the cause. He says, I have no idea why Christians don't do that. We got this from the Bible, he said. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. He <laughs> sent them out two by two. And undoubtedly, they came back with questions. Lord, why could we cast these demons out and we couldn't cast these out? And so he sent them out and they come back, sent them out and they come back. So they exercised more and they came back with a hunger. I think that's part of the thing that will help develop spiritual hunger uh, within us. So what is the goal of all this? Uh, that's verse 3. But don't forget this. Don't forget the that. There's a reason for desiring the pure milk of the word. It's not just to uh, so you can know more than other people. It's that you may grow. That you may grow thereby. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now this word gracious, let's look at it. The word Christos, useful, suitable, good, good, pleasant, kindly, easy. Does that make any sense to you? 
Is that the pure spiritual milk of the word that you may grow thereby? If indeed you've tasted the Lord is suitable, that doesn't make sense. If you've tasted the Lord is worthy, that doesn't make sense. If you've tasted that he's good, morally good, or reputable, that doesn't make sense. There's a dictionary by guys named Liddell and Scott on secular Greek, and there's a meaning there that I like. I think fits this perfectly. In a context, and context is always king, in a context of drinking, in a context of eating, this word means satisfying. That's perfect. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is satisfying. Satisfying. Have you tasted that the Lord is satisfying? Have you tasted that the Lord is satisfying? You know, over in Jeremiah 3, verse 2, Oops, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 3. Huh. Oops, I've done something wrong here. Well, here it is, verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, that's number one, the fountain of living waters. What did he tell the woman at the well? If you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. If you drink of the waters I give to you, the flowing waters, you'll never thirst again. They've committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. And one of the reasons we don't find life satisfying is that we're drinking at broken cisterns that are man-made. They may be enjoyable and may slake uh, our thirst for a time, but the thirst will always come back. You know, uh, since I left uh, Faith Bible Church where I passed, the current pastor there does. But oftentimes these are people who move to other cities. Where can I find a church where they teach verse by verse? And even here in the Woodlands, Texas, where they have 120 churches, I only know of three that teach verse by verse. I only know of three. And people are going to church and they feel like they're drinking out of broken cisterns at times. They come away unsatisfied. They come away, I want something more. And what they're longing for is the scriptures. Even if it's dispensed out by the preacher, it's more satisfying to hear that than to hear some of what they're listening to. But it's more important on a personal basis. Where do you find your satisfaction? Over my years as a pastor, I can't tell you the number of men who as they get between 40 and 50 and have been successful have come to me and says, is this it? You know, I have enough money. My kids are up and gone now. We're empty nesters. Is this it? He says, I, I've met my goals in life, and I'm not satisfied. There must be something more. And of course, books have been read, have been written about that, haven't they? Halftime. Bob Buford, a book on men who live for 30 years, from 20 to 50, being successful, and then at age 50 to the end of life, they want to do something more, or something more satisfying. And that's what this is all about. They want to make a life that will last. They want a life that will contribute to eternity. They want there to be a difference for having been on this planet. So that when God looks back at their time, the time that he's invested in them, that there's a profit. There's something that's going to glorify God forever out of it. He says, that's the salvation of your suke, the salvation of your life. So, Tony Evans had this to say. I was in his office one day, and he gave me a book he'd written on the kingdom. 
He said, this is of all the books I've written. He said, this is my favorite book. So from this book, he says, Jesus' earthly ministry was all about building God's kingdom. So therefore, it follows that we as Christians ought to make building God's kingdom the highest priority in our lives. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. There were people sitting around worrying about their 401ks. He says, don't worry about that. Take no thought for tomorrow. There's enough evil just for today. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all the things you need to make it through this life will be added unto you. Tony winds up saying, if God's kingdom is not your priority, you'll find out that your life will not be what God meant it to be. Well, you know, there's one other reason why I think you'll have a fuller life if you spend more time in his word. He says, here's the reason I wrote to you. This is 1 John 1, 4. We write these things to you that your joy may be full. And the way this is written, this verb, your joy may be full, over here, you can see in the bottom right, it's a perfect tense. It's a state of fullness, not just uh, for a few moments. The scriptures can give you a state of full joy. <clears throat> I saw that illustrated years ago when I was in college. Like a lot of guys in my class, we left uh, our hometowns uh, with a girlfriend we left behind that we thought we would marry someday. So we didn't have internet, we didn't have texting, we didn't have everything they have today. So we wrote letters, if you can believe that. This is back in the catacombs, dark ages. And uh, we wrote every day. And I could always tell, uh, you know, if the mail had arrived, because I'd run down to the mail room and everything was alphabetized. And as I got close to the A's, I could catch this waft of uh, perfume coming toward my nose. And I would grab it, wouldn't open it there. I was on the third floor of Baker College. I'd run back, run up three flights of stairs, run to my room, shut the door, lock it, sit at my desk, open the letter, open it up, and there it was. My dearest, darling, adorable Dave. And I would sit back and my heart would go pitter patter. And I was just so full of joy that she still loved me. But I had class to go to, so I'd run down to one of my so terrific chemical lectures, and I'd sit through that daydreaming about what she'd said. Bell would ring, and I'd have to rush off to biology at Anderson Hall, and I'd listen to another lecture by the guy who gave four lectures as to why there is no God. And uh, I was so bored, my Mine would go back to the letter, but I was getting, my memory was drifting a little, and I couldn't remember quite how she said it. Was it my darling, adorable, dearest Dave, or was my dearest, darling, adorable? And just how did she say that? The bell would ring, and I couldn't stand it. I'd run off half across campus all the way to Baker, run up three flights, go to my room, open the door, pull out the letter, and there it was. My dearest, darling, adorable Dave. And once again, I was full of joy. You say, that's really stupid, Anderson. <laughs> no, that's what this is saying right here. One of the reasons God gave you his word is because he loves you. And he wants you to know it every day. These are love letters. One reason why in our school we work so hard to maintain Free choice. Because when you get in a theological system that takes choice away, you take love away. Jamaica, did your husband ask you to marry him? He did. Why didn't he just hit you on the head with a club and drag you off to his cave? <laughs> <laughs> huh? I'd have gone kicking and screaming. Yeah. <laughs> could, you, could, could you have said no? I could have said no. So you had a choice, didn't you? I did. And he wanted you to have that choice. Why? He wanted to know if you loved him. That's right. Yeah. You take that choice away, he'd never know. <laughs> so that's what God wants. 
Seven dwarfs. Well, you know what? Singing, hi ho, hi ho. It's off to work we go. It took Snow White to show them there's a whole other world out there, a world where even you can make a difference. And Jesus comes into our lives pure as the driven snow. And he says, there's another world out there. And what you do in this world can impact that world. And so he says, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Okay, we usually have some time for questions and uh, you can ask questions on this or anything you want. If I don't know the answer, then I'll, yeah. Uh, on the, the part about uh, developing the hunger for God's word, uh, what, didn't we used to like read publicly and like encourage families to have time reading God's word out loud? Wasn't that a part of? Yeah, that, that's the parents helping to instill that within the kids. Yep. Uh, reading at, we used to do it, uh, are you talking about at home or? Yeah, I'm just saying like a, a public reading of, of the word just, you know. The only thing like that I remember is way long ago when you could do that at school. And they'd usually start go off over the public address system with, you know, every other time they read First Corinthians 13. Or, right. Uh, something like that. You know, Madeline Murray O'Hare took prayer out of the schools and the Bible kind of went with it. Long, long ago in the 60s, 1962, if I remember right. Yeah. But yeah, uh, uh, parents can help instill that hunger within children. Yeah, <laughs> we started our kids off with little games. Uh, I'd read them something from the Bible and ask them simple questions. And they got the question right, I'd give them a jelly bean. <laughs> yeah. That'll develop hunger. Other questions? I think people are getting ready to find out how the elections are going. <laughs> Anything else? All cool? All right, we'll let you go tonight. Hope you have a great week. God bless. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You, Play off.